All right, guys, welcome to our market update. I know this one has been long overdue since the last time I did one was, I think, five months ago before we started really selling hard on the NASDAQ, the S&P 500, and the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So I thought I would jump in today and give you an update on my view of the market, how things have unfolded. But again, give you a roadmap, a playbook on how things might unfold in the weeks and months ahead, because this has happened before. This is not new. Unless you're new to the market, you're a student, and, and you're really paying attention for the first time, then you're going to learn a lot because there's a wealth of information in this market update. And we're using simply history, history to identify what were the variables that gave us warning signs to, to what the road might look like ahead for the overall market. And I have here Drake uh, here with me to, to make this a little bit more in, uh, engaging. Hopefully he can ask a couple of questions and I can give um, my perspective on it and just make this more insightful. And, and, and hopefully you guys can, can learn a lot more from the session. So let me just share my screen and we'll get started. Okay, the first thing is, this is a continuation from the previous one I did. This was about, uh, what was it? Wow, five months ago. This was January 11th. <laughs> and if you haven't watched this, for those of you in our program, in our analyst prep program community, make sure you watch this because it'll give you insights into what I was looking at the market. And I was answering a question that was asked by one of our alumni is this the right time to invest in the stock market? And the short answer to that was no. And I explained very carefully and provided uh, some of the economic indicators and some of the variables that I pay attention to, to justify why I was bearish on the market and why I suggested that it's not the right time to, to buy. So now let's go through that process again. Let's, let's walk through some of the principles and guidelines that I've actually learned over the last decade of paying attention to the market, making my own mistakes, losing capital, making money as well. But when you remove all of the noise and just focus on simplicity, what do I follow? What are the variables or, or, or my own principles that you know, keep me out of trouble most of the time in the market? So number one is to understand that the market moves in cycles. You have economic periods of expansion, economic periods of contraction, okay? And those two type of market cycles or economic environments dictate the direction of the stock market. Pay attention to news because also the market is news driven. Um, it could be cryptocurrency, you know, back last, uh, what was it, last year, 2020 and 2021, crypto trading from home, that was all what was being promoted by the media. It was all hyped. Look at where some of the cryptocurrencies are at today. Look at some of the uh, high growth flyers or, or stay at home stocks are at today. Some of them are down 90% from their all time highs. So you have to understand hype and what the media is pumping and promoting. Okay, very important. Don't fall for that. Uh, presidential cycles are important, they matter. Economic policy matters. Uh, stimulus, rescue, bailout packages are key words to look after and, and anticipate what might happen to the overall market. Capital inflow coming from Congress or the Federal Reserve, whether or not they're increasing uh, credit limits in, in our entire financial system. These are very important points to consider. Federal Reserve interest rates, very important. The stock market is also emotional, hence fear and greed. I mean, we're, we're going to look at the most recent market crash that we just had uh, following uh, the, 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 the boom and bust cycles that, that, that we have from the staying at home stocks after COVID. Okay. Uh, earning season, very, very important as well. Political theater and the VIX fear indicator. So these are the 10 principles that I pay very close attention when I am analyzing the stock market. Okay. With that, Here's right now what's really surrounding the market and what I'm paying attention to. One is inflation is at around a 40-year high. I'm pretty sure you, many of you have seen this on the news, the media. You've seen it in gas prices. You've seen it with, with food prices, real estate. It has been affecting everything. And what has been the response from the Fed? Well, they're starting to raise interest rates. 
And if they're raising interest rates, what do you think that's going to mean for business? For those of you in the analyst prep program, when you're building your financial models, when you're calculating your interest income, what does it do? If a company has debt on their balance sheet, they're going to have to pay higher interest rate. If they need more sources of financing, if they need to borrow more money, guess what? It's going to be more expensive. If they need to raise equity, the stock market, it's pricing a higher risk premium. So what does that mean? It means raising capital is going to be more expensive. So the stock market is pricing all of that in. And that's why over the last uh, five to six months, we had a huge decline in tech specifically. So pay very close attention to this. And these are the headlines uh, at a big picture standpoint uh, that I'm looking at. So from here, then we go into looking at capital inflow and outflow. Where's the money going? This is very, very important because I'm looking at the sector spiders, the ETF indices, and this tells a story, right? We can map out from a time frame, different time series on a five-day basis, what has happened with each one of the ETFs, which essentially mimics the S&P 500, the US economic sectors. What has been the performance over the last six months and then year to date? And clearly, you can see that over the past six months or year to date, what has been the best performing sector? Energy, which is part of the inflation trade, essentially, right? Remember the stimulus package that Congress passed during the pandemic? It was about $2 trillion. And the Fed, they increased their balance sheet to about $6.7 trillion, right? In a matter of months, just to uh, uh, send checks to people staying at home just so that they can, you know, uh, provide or facilitate their daily or monthly living expenses, okay? It was a way to alleviate um, the severity of the pandemic. But when you stimulate the economy, when you inject trillions of dollars, what, are that, what, what, ha what happens? It has a ripple effect. It has a multiplier effect in the economy where more people have more dollars chasing goods, chasing assets, and there's limited quantity of it. Don't forget that we also had a supply chain disruption. So limited supply with a lot of demand of quantity of dollars chasing those assets, chasing those uh, uh, consumer purchase goods. What do you think is going to, what do you think will give you? Exactly what you're seeing now. Now you're seeing that inflation. And some investors, they anticipated this. So smart money, they were looking at this from the 70s and other periods of inflationary uh, economic times. So the ones that got in early, they're benefiting from that energy trade. And then every other sector is just down. So what do we do with this information? We have to anticipate what's going to be the next move over the next six to 12 months on the market. Very, very important. You have to anticipate and train your mind on what may occur in the economy, where capital is going to flow into over the next six to 12 months so that we can position our portfolio on the right sector, on the right stocks, and then ride the next cycle to the upside, ride the next wave. And this leads me to my next point, which is understanding the cycles or the phases of the stock market or a particular stock. I wrote an article about this. It's on our article section of our website where I explain in detail what phase one means, what phase two, phase three, and phase four, and phase five. So right now, when you're looking at the tech sector, specifically the tech sector, what do we get? Well, we have a sector that has already been declining, right? It's basically in the crash phase, phase number five. In 2020 and 2021, it was in phase four. It was like the public mania. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples so that you can see what I am referring to. But now we're in the crash phase. And what do we do? Well, now we wait. And we pay very close attention to stocks that have revenue growth rate of over 20%, have positive EBITDA, have positive earnings, and they're generating cash flow. And what do you do after that when you identify those companies? Well, the whole cycle begins again. Then we start with phase one, the accumulation phase. The meat is not covering these companies. They're left for dead. They're not popular right now, but they're good companies with good earnings and good growth rates. And then we wait for earnings. We wait for the confirmation. We wait for the big boys to come in and accumulate shares. And then the media start pumping and pro promoting them again. 
And then that's when you get the market, uh, I, I would say the rookies, you know, the wannabes, they start buying the stocks at all time highs. So what does this look like? What's a good example of this? Check this out. Here's Fossil. <laughs> when I see these type of graphs, I kind of look at this. It's like someone on a deathbed. You know, you get one beat, heartbeat, and then boop, and then it kind of comes right back down. The patient is dead. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if that's the right example to use, but that's how I interpret this stuff. But look at the cycle of Fossil, right? You know, it moves based on the growth rate of revenue. So what did I say right here? Okay. Based on our research shows that there is a high correlation between revenue growth and stock price performance. For example, a company that revenue grew at 10% a year, in theory, you can expect a stock price increase of 10% on a compounded basis on a year-by-year -year basis, right? Pay close attention to the growth and decline cycles. So here, I've included the growth rate of Fossil on a year-by-year -year basis. And you can see that you know from the time they did an IPO, to the crash, uh, well, this was a declining period. When did the decline really started happening? Right here in revenue, right here. Look at all these years of negative revenue growth rate. And it really started in 2016, right? So the market was already anticipating this decline. But during the years of growth, look at that, 2011, we could map it out right here, 2011, right? This period, revenue increased by 31%. Then the following year, 11%. Then the following year, 14%. Then 7%. Now you begin to get single digit revenue growth rate. So the market is always forward looking and paying close attention to what the earnings are gonna be of these, of these stocks, okay? So big picture, understand revenue growth rate and earnings matter because you can expect these type of moves. The same way it just happened in the recent, I would say tech bubble crash. Uh, that we had uh, in, in the last 24 months, okay? Um, from here, I'm giving you now a roadmap looking at history, right? The last decade. This is the S&P 500 at the top. And then at the bottom, we have the VIX volatility and the fear index. And right underneath, I have presidential cycles, right? Notice that during the Obama years, we had the VIX increase to around 40 or near 50 multiple times. You had it here, you had it here. And what happened? The market still recovered, okay? Then during the Trump administration years, right? You had the VIX almost around that area, one, two, and three times. And what happened? The market recovers, the market recovers, the market recovered again. Now we're in the Biden administration. This chart's a little bit outdated. You know, the, the market's actually a little bit up here. But now with Biden, in a rising interest rate environment, what are we getting? We're getting a market that is in decline, okay? And we have a rising interest rate environment, which in the next slide, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you what's been happening with interest rates. But again, study history and know what information, what variables, what indicators to plot when you're looking at the overall market index. Okay, here's just the VIX over a 20 plus year period, right? This is what I look at, pay very close attention to when the VIX get around 50 or even around the 70 areas. Okay, very, very important because it's a fear indicator. If you don't know what it is, just Google it. Figure out, find out what VIX is for yourself. This is about doing your own homework also. Okay, so this leads me now to where we are at in terms of interest rates. We're starting to increase, right? The Fed started to raise their interest rates. Now, the question is, when are they going to stop? What is a reasonable Fed funds rate for the economy to handle? Some, some people are saying 7%. Some people think 2.5%. Who's right? I, I have no idea. We'll see. Time will tell. But imagine if we get to an interest rate environment where the Fed increase the Fed funds rate to about 5%. And by the way, the US, when you look at the amount of debt outstanding, it just keeps increasing, record highs, record highs. And you know the government can continue to issue debt. The Fed can continue to fund it into infinity. It's just a matter of 
how much or when is enough. And if I look at history, for example, the Roman Empire, that empire lasted for over 400 years. And these guys used to demonetize their own currency, which back then was gold. They will mix precious metal, they, they will mix gold, they'll dilute it with silver, with copper and all of this stuff so that they can pay their troops, so that they can pay their uh, uh, partner countries or their allies to maintain and expand their empire. And eventually what collapsed that empire was within, they expanded, they couldn't maintain the military, they couldn't pay everyone and they debased the currency. The U.S. is about what, 200 plus years old, 200, give or take? We probably have another 100, 200 years if we look at, you know, any uh, lifespan on any uh, major empire. So that's what I'm looking at myself, kind of to see at what point in time in history are we living currently if we map out or, or, or if we look at it in parallel lines with the Roman Empire. We're the, basically the modern day Roman empire. And then there's other countries out there that are rising, growing to challenge the US, okay? So these are just things at a high level that I pay attention to. And also do your own Google research, type Federal Reserve interest rates, and you're gonna get to see what the media is now promoting, right? Raising interest rates, raising interest rates. Why are they doing that? Because of inflation. Inflation's at all time highs. The people that the government is supposed to protect right? The average American. Now they're being hurt because of the action and the steps taken by the Fed and taken by Congress. So they need to bring back inflation and, and reduce the cost of living. And that might mean that the Fed chairman, he's considering raising interest rates and probably bringing a recession. Can they engineer a way where raising their Fed funds rate doesn't lead to a recession. I'm in the camp that maybe they can do it because they've studied what happened in the 2000s during the financial crisis. They studied the, talk, uh, the, the tech stock bubble of the 2000s. They looked at the 90s. They looked at the 80s. They looked at the 70s. And maybe they can do it. I think they have enough tools in their toolkit to bring down inflation and maybe maintain the economy from heading into a recession. It's never been done, but I think they can probably do it. If not, then, hey, we'll probably have a temporary period where GDP will contract, maybe negative half a percent or maybe negative GDP of 1%. Um, but it needs to happen in order to maintain uh, the cost of living relatively reasonable for the average American, because this right here is what really swings election. So that's where po politics comes into, into play. And like I said before, the stock market pays also attention to, to what's happening in politics. I call it political theater. And that does influence and impacts the stock market. So here is inflation, right? Looking at it from a 60 year period. The last time inflation was at around 20%. This was around the fifties. Then it came back around 15% in, in 1980s. I mean, th during the seventies, this was where Paul Volcker was the Fed chairman and Overnight, this guy like triple or quadruple interest rates. So there is precedent, there is history. If you want to be in the finance space, if you want to be a market participant, study history because it's important. You, you, not only you got to be a practitioner, but you also have to be a student of the game. And the game is always changing. But if you have history as your ally, you can study what was the demographics of the, of the country, what was the fastest growing sector, what were the companies that were leading innovation and growing the U.S. economy? And then we can find the variables that helped investors capitalize in that, in, in that environment a decade, two decades ago, three decades ago, and apply that today, where right now tech is being punished, but there's a lot of opportunities to be found in tech. Okay. Uh, I wanted to bring a, uh, an example to bring things more into perspective and, and show you how inflation has been affecting uh, companies, specifically Target, okay, and how the stock price performed after they reported earnings. So many of you already know how to read an income statement if you're in the analyst prep program. This is Target's quarterly three-month income statement report. And what I am highlighting here is the change 
in right here, the growth in cost of sales and also SGNA and also operating income. Look at from one year to the next, from 2021 to 2022, look at the increase in cost of sales up 10.4%, growing faster than at the rate that they grew revenue. Revenue grew at 4%, but expenses grew faster. What does that mean? It means that they're less profitable. It means that it's going to show somewhere in their operating income. There it is. Look at the decline in their operating income. From 2.3 billion down by 1 billion to 1.3 billion. Look at that decline. Talk about inflation. Talk about supply chain disruptions. Boom. You get to see it right there in the numbers. You get to see it. We, we're looking at the numbers, but if you really put stories behind it, that's the, 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 the driver um, driving the truck from point A to point B and all of the merchandises. What do they need? They need fuel. They need gas prices. If you have a car, have you seen how much it costs to fill up your tank now? Now imagine the billions of dollars that, co that Costco, Target, Walmart had to spend in order to move their cargo and their products from point A to point B. It's essentially inventory. Now look how the market reacted to that piece of news. Boom. <laughs> look at the drop on this stock just in one week. This stock declined 20%. And, not, and it wasn't just Target, okay? It was Costco, Walmart, Amazon, and the entire retail index. Let's take a look at this quickly. Let me pull up this chart right here, and we can pull up easily Target. Look at that. And on a daily time frame, look at that big drop. See what happens in the market in rising interest rate environments, okay? Take a look at Walmart. Oh, my God. Take a look at uh, the XRT, which is the retail index, right? Uh, is that the XRT? Sector spider retail. Yeah, look at that. It's, it's, it's basically it's been declining since Q4 of 2021, right? These guys were already anticipating capital inflow, capital outflow. They, are, they were already anticipating this move. So now you get to see in real time, how the stock market reacts to the data. Okay. Now, here is the example that I wanted to showcase on where we are at with interest rates. See, now there's now that rising interest rate period was what I was anticipating four or five months ago when I did my market update. And I said, guys, be careful. Now it's not the time to buy. And then the market ended up declining, I think, since then, like 20% or so. Take a look at the QQQs. Look at that, right? Started to decline. Take a look at the spies. Started also to decline. Take a look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Started to decline. We're still in a bear market, by the way. I think this market is going to continue going lower. It's just going to exacerbate the people that want to come in, buy. They want to be early. And these people are going to get hurt. Oh, man, they're going to get hurt. Okay, so... What is the playbook? Take a look at what happened after the initial periods of rising interest rates back from 2016 to 2018 and 2019. What I like to do is look at some of the main winning stocks of that period and how they unfolded, how they performed. So during rising interest rate environments, during bear markets, you're going to have winners. And it's our jobs as market participants, our stock pickers, to find them, at least for myself. I mean, I, I view this as a game. And I want to find those companies. I want to find those stocks. So we're going to still have rights in interest rate. But there's going to be a temporary period where the Fed is going to pause. During this period is where some of the next winners are going to emerge from the tech sector. That could be six or 12 months from now. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know. But what I do know, I'm going to be paying very close attention to capital inflows and outflows. I'm going to be paying very close attention to earnings. I'm going to be paying very close attention to the company financial statements report. Are they growing revenue double digits? For me personally, my preference over 20% over the next five or 10 years. 20%, uh, right? That's what I said. 
Sometimes I, I speak too quickly that my mind can't even keep up. <laughs> I want to make sure that they're profitable and they're generating free cash flow. So here's a quick example. Let me change this. Okay. And let's pull up this period, 2018. And let's look at Medtronics. Look at Medtronics perform during a rise in interest rate cycle, right? Medtronics from 2016 to 2017 was basically flat, not doing anything, but then they broke out. This is breaking resistance. If those of you have completed the technical analysis module, you know what I'm talking about. If those of you are enrolled in my stock investing course, when I'm talking about technical analysis, price action, breaking out, you know exactly what I refer here. But look at this stock. It went from $50 to $250. That's a 5X, right? In about a 12-month period. Again, in a rising interest rate cycle. Let's look at Amazon, okay? Amazon, you know, had a declining period for weeks in Q4 of 2015 and maybe in the first quarter of 2016, but it's still recovering, continue increasing, okay? Let's take a look at another one. Coherent. 2016, the stock keep increasing, breaks out in Q4 of 2016. And look at that, continue making all time high. And then it declines and crashes, right? Remember the stock phase model, phase one, two, three, four, and five? You could basically map it out and put it over it, right? Overlay it. And it tells the same story. Take a look at apply optoelectronics. Same thing, right? During the rising interest rate environment, the stock didn't do much. But then once we got into a comfortable period with higher rates, this stock reported better than expected earnings. And look at this, more than double. And then <laughs> the media, the hype, the mania, and then it crashes and declines from there. Okay? So go through this cycle for, for yourself. Look at Netflix. Same situation. I mean, same situation, right? During 2016, the stock was basically flat, doing nothing. And then you get a period of better than expected earnings where we get into a flat interest rate cycle where the Fed is not going to raise interest rate for, for a period of time. They're, they're going to watch the data. They're going to be data dependent. They're going to see what happens in the economy. And, that, and those are the periods where high growth tech stocks can come back and flourish, increase, and really move up in price. Okay. Um, here's another one. Oh, one of the biggest winners, Shopify. Shopify broke out in 2017, but during 2016, the stock basically was doing nothing, right? They did an IPO, stayed below the all-time high, and then they broke out in 2017. Look at interest rates. What was happening with interest rates during that period? See? Increasing. Okay? So go through these examples yourself, right? And paint the picture. Go back. Study it. Because that's exactly what I'm doing right now. And I'm just waiting. I'm playing uh, intermediate, intermediate uh, the intermediate bounces. I'm actually playing it myself, but that, that's more of an active trader approach, right? Moving around positions, you know, based on the market volatility, for example, with Amazon. See here? And I talk about this in our technical analysis module right? There's structure and patterns to how things move. To the upside, you get the first people that come in, they ride it to the upside, profit-taking shake-off, and then we get the next leg to the upside. Same thing to the downside. The first wave of sellers, the selling eases, then you get people to start buying again, thinking that buying the dip works all the time until it doesn't, and then they pull the rug underneath you and continues selling to the downside, more downward pressure. It's exactly what just happened. Goes down, fool some people in, and boom, they drop the rug underneath you. Now we're doing it again. Okay, so over the last two weeks, I was basically just playing this dead cat bounce right here. If you want to add a technical finance jargon word from, from a trading standpoint, this is a dead cat bounce. On a daily time frame, you're seeing it, right? The stock is up about 15% in about five trading sessions. But do you think it's going to continue to go up? And don't forget that Amazon has a 20 uh, to 1 stock split coming up. So 
this thing might be short lived, temporary bounce, and then it might decline. Okay. Um, look at Google. Same thing might be happening. Look at Tesla. Same thing might be happening. Look at what's another major one? Uh, Microsoft. Same thing might be happening. Look at Apple. Same thing might be happening. So be careful. You do not need to be the first one in. Take a step back. Watch, observe, and learn. Okay, so these are most of the main points that I really wanted to cover up in this uh, market update, which is if you don't have enough experience, stay out of the market. If you want to buy tech, wait. It's not the time yet. I think we still have maybe one more quarter, um, the rest of the summer, and maybe in Q4 of this year when we get another earnings season and we are more comfortable with what the Fed is doing and we get into a, a comfortable interest rate uh, level. That's when market participants are probably going to be a little bit more, more comfortable. And then they're going to go bargain shopping, bargain hunting, and they're going to be finding probably good tech stocks to buy. And then once those stocks are ready for prime time, then I'll probably show which ones they are and which one to pay attention to. Um, but that's pretty much what I wanted to cover, Drake. Um, did you have any questions on your end so that you know we can fill in as much as possible? I, I know we have uh, limited time for this session. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't really have many questions uh, about what you're bringing up here. Um, you know, if I could jump in on some uh, added details that I think are also kind of important to pay attention to. Yeah. Uh, and actually, this is actually this is something that I think everybody. Uh, in the program should look into, and it's called the Cantillion effect. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was written back in the 1700s by an economist in uh, France. And it pretty much is just a roadmap for what happens every time a central, uh, central bank stimulates the economy by throwing a bunch of cash at it. And it's, it's basically a sugar rush uh, for the stock market. And you know what happens with a sugar rush is it's jacked up at first for about a half hour to an hour, but then you start to crash. And that sugar wears off and you start feeling kind of tired. Uh, but it, it's a very interesting uh, theory uh, and it could be proven over and over and over again. But always the first thing you see is you see these asset, these asset prices mm -hmm. shoot through the roof yeah. and then slowly, slowly other prices start to rise. And then finally wages rise. And it's normally yep. not anywhere near the price impacts that have already happened. Yep. Um, exactly. And then another thing definitely pay attention to, again, for everyone in the program is next week, uh, we should see the employment and the CPI reports for May come out. Uh, and so I think that's going to be a big thing. Uh, it is important to remember, I know CPI is always like the headline inflation report, but the Federal Reserve pays attention to PCE. Uh, but either way, if we see the, those numbers uh, not really moved so much. I think CPI was at 8.3% last month. If that doesn't really move too much, I think that could be even more pressure on the Fed to keep raising that federal funds rate. Okay. No, th th those are a good point. And I think going back to, to, to the first one that you made, look, this is really understanding human psychology and human behavior. It's a social mm -hmm. science. Economics is a science. And the way that we get to participate in the market is by just looking at the data and then looking at capital inflows and outflows and trying to anticipate what the consumer is going to buy, what the consumer is going to sell, uh, how are they going to adjust their purchasing behavior in this new environment. An example of that, there. okay, so a winning stock in this environment, Dollar Tree. Let's pull it up. They reported oh, earnings. Dollar General. Is it? Uh, let's see. So you have Dollar General and Dollar. They're competitors. Let me see. Uh, DG. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They're 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 separate. Okay. Yep. Okay. So let me go back to Dollar Tree because they reported earnings and look at the gap up on the stock. Mm -hmm. Better than expected. So management raised their guidance. Okay. And what they're noticing is that the consumer, their basket of goods is changing. They're adapting to an inflationary economy. They're adapting their purchasing behavior and you're getting to see it on the stock market. So if you really understand how people are going to behave and how they're going to spend their money, you can easily find the publicly traded companies that are going to benefit. And if you have 
analyst skill sets, like what we're providing in teaching, which I think is a life skill, is essential. You can build your model five years out, look at the cash flow, do a discounted cash flow analysis, do comparable company analysis, and come up with your own price target and place your bet, right? Come up with your investment thesis, okay? And that is a more rational way of making investment decisions rather than just buying and selling, you know, um, blindly, like most people did during the 2021 market bubble. Look at this thing. Oh my God. Look at it. Look at GameStop. Look at this thing. Look at, what was the other one? AMC. Mm -hmm. Look at this thing. What was the other one? Um, Pen gaming. Oh yeah. From Barstool Sports. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I can only imagine the people that bought up here and they're still holding pain. Look, I mean, Hey, it could come back up here maybe 10 oh. years later, right? It could come back up here, but are you going to be way holding a bad position, a losing trade for 10 years just to break even? I mean, calculate the IRR, calculate the compounder on your growth rate on that. Save your emotional capital. Save yourself the pain. This is why many of the professional uh, uh, traders and investors out there, what, what are they, the number one rule is don't lose money. Cut your, loose, your, your losses quickly and then live to fight another day. Preserve your capital, right? You always have to be forward-looking on these things. And I know that myself, when I first started out in this game, my mistakes when I would make a bad decision, when I would lose money, I would hammer myself and punish myself for getting it wrong for a day, sometimes a week. Now, I'll think about it for a minute. Next. Move on to the next. There's always another opportunity. Right. Yeah, it's actually, it's funny you brought up Dollar Tree because um, way back when uh, I think I was a sophomore, I did an investment thesis on Dollar General and it started as an investment thesis on Dollar Tree because during the 2008 recession, Dollar Tree saw price appreciation of like 60 plus percent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but Dollar General at the time was under private placement. Mm -hmm. um, but then they were, they IPO'd, I believe it was 2009 or 10, they IPO'd. Uh, and they just started beating out Dollar Tree and the number of stores that they were opening up. And so we ended up switching our investment thesis from a buy on Dollar Tree to a buy on Dollar General. Wow. Okay. Well, good. I, I think it's, it, it serves a good practice and a, and a good case study for, for you to, to uh, reference. But now you have technical skills. Now mm. you could do this and, and, and really look at it from an intelligent uh, investor perspective and really understand what other players in the market are maybe looking at from the fundamental analyst perspective, maybe from a technical trader perspective, right? And even an economist standpoint as well, mm. okay? So I think this is good. The, the last point that I'll mention here is energy. Look at energy. Look at it on a weekly time frame. Look at it on a monthly time frame. right? It's been on a bull run. If you look at the XLE, we could probably get up here. could probably get to 100. But if you look at the specific individual names, like the Chevrons of the world, look at this, right? Um, let me look at it on a weekly time frame. See, it's in an upward trend. It's moving higher, okay? Look at ExxonMobil. Same thing, upward trend. Very different from tech. Why? Because capital has been flowing into the sector because of price inflation, higher energy costs at the pump, crude oil is more expensive. So these guys, their margins, their cash flow is increasing, it's expanding, where everyone else in the economy is probably hurting every other sector with a few nuggets of, of, of pockets of higher profits. And it's our job to, to find it and, and figure out where they are at. Um, would I be buying energy here at this level? No, no, absolutely not, right? The peer is to have been buying energy, we're doing these pullbacks. Here, here, consolidation periods, right? Right. I mean, this is a breakout point, but I wouldn't chase. I would probably wait for another little pullback and anticipate the next move to the upside, provided that the fundamentals are still intact for the inflation trade. All right. Uh, what else do we have here? I, th I think Slumber J2, this is a service. Yeah, look at this, but look where it's coming from. Yeah. Yeah. So you can pick your pockets, you can pick your battles, but if not stay on the sideline and just study, learn, right? The market is always going to be here. 
just be ready for the right opportunities when they come. And I think tech, some names will come back. Um, when they do, hopefully we'll be able to share and discuss it in the community. And what I would really like to see, my, my, my big vision is to have the analyst community, all of our members have the analyst skill set where when we start sharing these types of reports, right? This is on Netflix. This is one of our interns right now. She has a $300 price target on, on, on Netflix, okay? Half most of our students do these type of analysis and then double check each other's work, right? I view this as the professional version of Wall Street Bets. <laughs> so it starts first with teaching the technical skills, making sure you guys have the right knowledge, and then we can deploy it and apply it in real time. And then hopefully together we will all benefit from it. Yeah, I think right. it's uh, I think it's exciting. And you know what? Um, even though like bear markets can be kind of scary, I think it was Warren Buffett who said it. You make most of your money in a bear market. The opportunities yeah. are there. I mean, it, it, it's like when you go to uh, a retail store and, you know, sometimes you have certain products that are not selling well. They have them on a different rack. It's like selling on clearance where last season, those same products were mar marked up, you know, three times higher the price, but now you could get it at maybe 50% cheaper. Mm -hmm. Was well, the same thing with the stock market. It's inventory. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Well, I hope this was insightful. I know I've, I've been wanting to do this for quite some time, but uh, glad that I was able to do it today and give everyone just my viewpoint on the market, what to pay attention to, and maybe give you guys, you know, some value. Hopefully this helps. All right. With that being said, take care and I'll see you guys on the next one. Bye.